Greetings. My name is Karen Bandine Roach. I'm the Frank Hurley and Catherine Dorier Professor and Chair of Biostatistics at Johns Hopkins. And it's my pleasure to be with you today to go over a very brief module to introduce competing risks analysis. All right, now let's close out with just a very brief survey of other approaches one might take to study competing risks. The first is what's called subdistribution regression. And in fact, this is the chief competitor to cause specific regression. I've listed the reference for you um, right there at the top of the slide. So the basic idea of this technique is literally regression modeling for the cumulative incidence function. And so you can see why one very convenient way to estimate the cumulative incidence function is just to use this regression technique. It's, it's totally um, designed for it. So the estimand here is really interesting. Um, so you have to pay attention closely here. For some distribution regression, the, the estimate estimand is the hazard function for a particular random time. For the random time defined as the time to the event, if that's the event of interest, but infinity otherwise. And so it's doing something completely different with the risk set than cause specific re regression is. So for example, imagine that discharge is my competing event. So death is my event of interest, discharge is a competing event. For subdistribution regression, you would basically put all of the discharge times out to infinity so that individuals discharged remain in the risk set for the target event of death. Right, so you can sort of see how that's getting at cumulative incidence. You're interested in incidence overall, you know, whether or not a person was ultimately discharged or not. And, and we actually debated this a lot in our group, particularly for the purposes of regress of prediction. We did end up going with the cause specific model, but that means if you're setting up a prediction algorithm, then you're only utilizing those people who haven't been discharged yet, as opposed to in this method, risk for death, you'd also be including people who ultimately were discharged. So the primary utility of this method really is forecasting. You know, we might well want to know of all those individuals, you know, who ultimately died. Um, even including people, you know, the, the proportion, uh, even among people who ultimately were discharged. However, this method is considered by many to be less useful for addressing individual risk and etiology because this hazard is such a weird hypothetical thing. Um, and I've given you a nice reference describing that there. And so we've described how in our example, um, it's a real serious consideration between this method and cause specific modeling for the treatment of discharge. What about a couple of other approaches? Well, um, the first is to use composite outcomes rather than competing. And so the, the hallmark example here is event-free survival as the good outcome. Conversely, that would mean the composite outcome of having severe disease onset or death. And so this is a perfectly appropriate approach when composite outcomes are meaningful, as I believe we, we felt that they were in our COVID study. And so you can see a, a citation for a publication given to you there. Just to compare you know, between those methods, in this chart, you see for age at the top half and male versus a reference of female at the bottom half, um, four different estimates of relative hazards along with confidence intervals. The first two are the ones that we've already talked through. The ones treating severe status um, is second and death is first as fully competing risks. So for age, we saw a very large 
relative risk for death before the onset of severe disease, almost no association for onset of severe disease before death. The other two have to do for um, a composite outcome um, and time to just death taken overall. So in the middle of the chart, that's the hazard ratio for just death before discharge, not treating severe disease onset as competing. We already talked through the fact that um, the relative hazard was on the order of um, uh, 0.67, uh, 1.67 1, 1 here. And, and then the very bottom one is for the composite outcome. So notice with age, there's a statistically significant association with the composite outcome, but it's clinically really small. Um, you know, it's 1.1 or something like that. So one would have to be a little careful with composite outcomes in a case like this to not mask an association that was quite large with one of the outcomes and not so much with the other. In contrast, at the bottom of the slide, you can see for male versus female, the relative risks for the two competing risks are quite comparable at the top of the slide. Um, so if, that if you go to the composite outcome at the bottom, then you, you have a relative risk of severe disease onset or death for men versus women that is quite substantial and not so very much different from either one of the, the element risks. So bottom line, composite outcomes analysis can be useful. You want to be a little bit careful of not masking an effect by merging a composite outcome that is not associated with primary covariates with one that, that is. One other uh, alternative approach is mixture modeling. And so in these models, one separately models the time to the first failure, whatever cause that may be due to, and then something like a logistic regression or whatever for the type of failure. Um, these models are, are very dependent on the specification of the model. And so they tend not to be used as much as the others we've discussed. There's a reference though, in case you're interested. And then finally, I've animated in an overall reference that we circulated a priori, um, and I think does a really nice job describing all of these concepts in apprehensible terms. So that brings us to the end of our lecture. Hope that um, you are able to recognize the cumulative incidence function as an analog to Kaplan-Meier analysis that is tailored to and specifically appropriate for characterizing competing risks, uh, time course of their probabilities in a way that Kaplan-Meier analysis is not. Secondly, cause-specific hazard regression as a direct analog to Cox proportional hazards modeling, um, easy to implement if one is careful about defining censoring in the right way and in interpreting the coefficients as risk of event of interest before the other competing risks occur. And then finally, just to be able to identify other competing risks regression approaches like subdistribution regression, composite outcomes regression, or mixture modeling. I've enjoyed being with you. I hope it's been useful, and I wish you well. <laughs>